Good evening, my dear patients. It is I, Dr. Moxmo, here with you on your Friday night for an extra special creepy pasta reading. One of three, in fact, to celebrate the great achievements that this channel has reached this week. Not only did we reach and surpass through the 500 subscriber mark on Monday, but this weekend marks my three-year anniversary of my storytelling career. Being that angsty high school student that I was back in 2014 on a twisted journey of self-discovery, I was never able to even picture myself being in a fraction of the moment I am in now. Truly, it is only thanks to the mass amount of support that the horror community in its entirety has provided for me. From every writer, composer, fellow narrator, and as well as the readers and listeners like you that I am able to live in this moment. So to you personally, whether you have been with me for years or have just quite recently experienced my narrations, I want to offer you the deepest amount of gratitude for your viewership, encouragement, and countless blessings you bestow upon me. As corny as it sounds, it is only due to my lack of words to truly express how thankful I am for being able to experience this very moment. But before I offer a final toast towards the future, I wanted to take a moment and reflect on the past and dedicate the next two readings to stories I have narrated in the past but only now feel that I am now capable of bringing proper justice to them now, before posting the 500 subscriber special story next Friday. Yes, this weekend reflects on the past, next week the present, and from then on the future. Tonight's story comes from my very first year of narrating, one that was featured in my Halloween spectacular. That last word is implied as loosely as possible, as that first Halloween special was so bland and pathetic that I truly even wonder why I even bothered trying to do one in the first place. Now that I've thought about it, I know for a fact that I didn't even finish it. Oh, truly, some things are better left in the past. But this story is one that shouldn't be, as I believe it is so well written and offers such a good twist on the simple idea of a camping trip gone wrong. Now, with no more distractions, I ask you, like I do with all my other readings, to sit back and relax. Your mind is an open canvas. My voice and the words of the story shall be the tools and paint you need to create the painting in your mind. What image shall you create as we delve into the tale of the Huntsville Camping Trip I went camping about three weekends ago in the Huntsville National Forest in Texas. Me and three friends that came home for the weekend, they are all in college and usually we all get together at least once a year. My dear old friends from high school days. For the camping trip, we planned to go backpacking deep in the forest, live off the fish we can catch and animals that we can trap. We have been doing this for a while in Texas and in numerous places like Arizona, Colorado, if anyone is familiar with the Spanish peaks there, and New Mexico, so we're pretty much used to anything you'd encounter out there. It was my turn to pick where we went camping, so I chose Huntsville. More accurately, it's Huntsville, New Waverly. We drive up there, park our car in the camping park spot, 
and start walking off into the forest. We had some laughs along the way, everyone catching up with each other's lives since so much time had passed. We walked until it started to get dark and set up camp where we stopped. Everyone gathered wood to make a fire and we set our tent up. And we do what we always do. Try and scare each other with weird stories. Around this time, we started to smell something very faint. It was noticeable, but not overbearing. We couldn't put our finger on what it was, so we just carried on. Mike had to go piss, and he walked off in the forest. A second later, he came running back, piss all down his jeans like he'd missed really bad. Immediately, we all crack up and throw some jokes at him, but then we noticed that he was white as snow and trying to catch his breath. He starts screaming at us to follow him and runs off. We all get serious and go follow him, not knowing what the problem was. We start to hear a faint scream and crying in the distance in the direction we were running. It was pitch black away from the camp and Mike had the only flashlight. We left ours at the camp, and he had his from his trip taking a piss. So at this stage, we didn't have much choice but to follow the light, which was frantically pointing here and there in front of him. The scream gets closer, and Mike starts to slow down. We then notice a ratty, old cabin that looked like it was abandoned except for a faint light that we could see from one of the old, mildew-covered windows. The crying was intense, and whoever it was couldn't breathe enough to let out a full yell. We all followed Mike up to the front door, and we could all hear the crying from inside. As soon as he knocked on the front door, it stopped. We all waited and heard really heavy footsteps walking fast to the door. There was a giant slam against it and the sound of a bolt unlocking. Then nothing. We waited for a bit, knocked a few more times, but still nothing happened. We walked around the house. There was no fucking way that any of us were leaving each other's side and noticed a window which was a good way up. Alex took a deep breath and asked us to give him a boost so he could see inside. Me and Mike lifted him up towards the window. We watched him brush away some dirt and cobwebs from the window and place his face close to it to try and see something. There was a quick pause. Then suddenly, he breathed in fast and let out a loud scream. He fell back from the window, screaming bloody murder the whole way. We all tried to calm him down, but he was hysterical. We went to him, but he started to shake, punch, kick, you name it, and then took off towards the camp. None of us wanted to be separated, so we all ran close behind him. We caught up to him and grabbed him to set him down. The fire was dying out, so I grabbed some nearby wood that we collected and added it to the flames. My hands were shaking and I had to do something. I went back to Alex and we all tried to calm him down, but he wouldn't. He kept screaming and was breathing so hard that he eventually fainted. All of us were terrified now, and we all kept the fire high until sunrise. Periodically, Alex kept waking up, screaming just like before. By sunrise, he was up and looked catatonic, just mumbling to himself and whimpering. Me and Mike decided to go look at the cabin now that it was daylight. We searched where we thought it was, except there was nothing there, nothing at all. 
The indistinct smell from last night had now grown into a very strong stench of something dead. Something stale. We headed back to the camping site. When we got there, we found Alex had chewed into the sides of his face and swallowed so much blood that he was throwing up. John was at his back, and he looked like he was about to die from exhaustion. I guess we all looked that way. I just didn't notice until I saw his face. Alex then said quietly that we needed to leave. Now. We all started to pack up the tent. It started to rain really heavily, and the skies started to grow really dark. Alex started going to a panic. He went and grabbed a big stick and yelled at us to leave it and leave it now or he'd knock us all out and drag us out of here himself. Mike started to yell at him and they started to fight. We broke it up and finished packing and then started to make our way back. After a little while, we arrived at a creek we had crossed the previous day. Only now it was flooded over, and the water was moving too fast for us to cross it. Alex started to scream again, yelling at Mike for taking his time packing up the tent when we could have gone out of here. This went on for a while, until we finally convinced Alex to calm down and tell us what happened. He said, as soon as he put his face to the glass, a face on the other side did the same thing and started to smile really big. It had dark eyes and a dark mouth which was much bigger than Alex's. As the smile got as large as it could, a giant shadow behind it swung something down and sliced its face off. The face was stuck to the window and he said it started to laugh quietly as it slid down. Mike, still pissed off, started to argue with him again. We eventually started to follow the creek for a way to cross. We then started to see toys floating in the creek. Really old toys. Old Barbie and baby dolls. This wasn't like any other kind of old trash floating in a creek though. This was a lot of Barbie and baby dolls. One washed towards the side and Mike picked it up. It had some kind of voice chip that was dying and started to say some gurgled words we couldn't understand, followed by its sad excuse for laughter. Then, it sounded like it was whispering. We thought the batteries must be dying and he threw it down. We kept going and the sun was starting to set. Alex was freaking out more by now and was whimpering and breathing heavily. We all started to see shadows move behind the trees, something we all called BS on until we all were seeing it, until we all were seeing it. It was barely light out and we stopped as soon as we saw the cabin right in front of us. None of us know what to think. Mike says, Ugh, this is bull. I'm going in there. Alex tries to stop him. We all do. All of us just want to go home. Mike says to all of us to screw off, do our own thing. He doesn't care anymore. This is all just a big joke. We start to hear hundreds of the same sort of baby dolls as before, laughing, whispering, and trying to sing. We start to move forward past the cabin, all of us, and kept pushing forward. We smelled something dead in the air, something stale, the same something as before. We started to hear something crying and something screaming. We kept on going. We eventually crossed the creek and left the woods. We get back into our vehicle 
It's pitch black, and we drive. We are about to get onto the 45 to Houston, but the road is under construction and can't be accessed, and it points to a detour. As we head down towards the detour, it seems to be a small, bumpy dirt road going into the woods. We then see a young girl come up to us. She looks like she was in trouble, young and pretty. She approaches the passenger side door and she looks like she's really drugged up or had been beaten. Alex doesn't roll down the windows, nor does he open the door. She reaches for the handle and he immediately locks it. She puts her face on the window and starts to smile really <laughs> big. We floor it. Alex starts to cry and scream and we were all breathing heavy. We finally cut onto a street that takes us to the 45 and we take it the whole way. When we get back to my apartment, everyone doesn't know what to say and we all break apart and go our separate ways. Mike messages me later and says that he's going to go back. I try to convince him not to and all he does is say that it was our own minds that were screwing with us. I think he just went to prove to himself that he really wasn't scared. I can smell that stench everywhere now. I don't go out. I just stay in and don't answer the door. Last week, everyone I met was acting really strange. People that I knew for a long time and total strangers. My own father, when I went to his place to eat supper with him, he just watched me strangely when I was sitting down. He didn't say a word the whole time. I kept asking him what was wrong, but all he did was slowly shake his head. When I was leaving to go home, I turned around to wave, but then I saw that he had black eyes and an open mouth like he was in pain. When I started to walk back, he shut the door and bolted it. I stayed there, knocking and knocking. Nothing. I called him, but his phone was disconnected. I even called the police, and halfway through the questions they were asking me, the connection started to fade into static. I could hear a faint mumbling, singing, and laughing. Mike has completely vanished. There's not even a record of him being alive. When I call Alex's house, they talk to me like I'm some sort of salesman. They say they don't know any Alex, and to please stop calling. The person who tells me that is Alex's mother. I can't even get a hold of John. Someone knocked on my door, and when I went to look, I saw a face completely covering the people and a giant smile started to form. I tried to call the cops and instead of it turning into static, they too got really strange. Sir, are you affected by any drugs at the moment? What? No! Are you coming home anytime soon? Excuse me? Come home. My mail slot swings every now and then. Someone is sliding pieces of baby dolls through it. I try to call people now, and all I can hear is static and bad baby doll noises and this crying and screaming. My TV is busted, but when I go to piss, I can hear it on. I might be going insane. Whoever lives above me started to scream in pain and crying deeply recently. I hear giant footsteps from their apartment. I hear bangs and something falling to the ground. From the neighbors to the right of my apartment, I hear what sounds like a baby that never gets tended to, and then it sounds like a baby doll whose batteries are dying. My phone has been ringing now, and it's Alex telling me things in a language that I have never heard before, nor could I even manage to repeat. I keep getting emails of pictures of 
black and small correlations. Someone knocks on the door, then they slam against it. I hear the bolts unlocking, one by one, and I run to make sure I lock all of them back. <laughs> then, I sit down, and begin.